very pleased to welcome you to the 20th uh, um, Development Discussion Days uh, here today. It is actually 20 years that we created uh, these discussion days, 20 years of fruitful cooperation. I am especially happy as a uh, former student of uh, Humboldt University and uh, I have spent most of my political uh, career life at the Henrich Boll Trust. I am also very pleased that Magitta Mina is a postgraduate student that uh, now coordinates this work at the level of SLE. Not anybody of you uh, may know that uh, those postgraduate students of SLE prepare uh, these discussion days. Uh, um, and Magitta Mina is uh, somebody who uh, uh, works full-time for Heinrich Böll Stiftung. That's really great to know. Within these uh, 20 years, uh, those um, Entwicklungspolitische Diskussionstages have become one very important forum, political forum in uh, Germany. And for years, many important experts from uh, um, have participated as young people really form and uh, incarnate these days. They're always at the height of discussions. We can see that we're talking about hydrogen partnerships, uh, uh, value chains, the Green Deal, etc. Those are the top priority uh, uh, on the agenda, on the political agendas. And uh, we've really uh, dared to also um, arrive on uh, the digital age as we um, meet today here uh, on the screen. And we will see whether after the Corona period, we will be able to meet again in presence or uh, whether we uh, marry these discussions with a digital format. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, um, all our corroborate partners of SLE, as my, uh, to Magitta Mina and uh, Susan Nobert for these uh, very uncomplicated, simple and fruitful corporations, as well as uh, the uh, students' network of Heinrich Böll uh, um, Trust. Um, a lot, thing, many thanks to the, all the postgraduates who have uh, prepared in a very professional way these um, um, discussion days on uh, development policies and all of those who accompanied uh, these days and coordinated, has coordinated these days. Johanna Bereskoske, who, um, very many thanks to her. They have she is backed up uh, these discussions uh, uh, not on the forefront but it's very important uh, to thank her as well so thanks a lot uh, with these uh, words i'd like to hand over to sun and norbert i'm looking forward to our discussions thank you so much mr haas i am also very pleased to welcome you dear discussants dear um honorable uh, audience and the participants of the uh, 29th, uh, 29th uh, year of, uh, of the post credit course and also all the uh, members of Heinrich Böll Stiftung. I'm so pleased because it's the 20th year of our uh, discussion days. We uh, are celebrating in university, uh, sorry, in anniversary. Uh, it is, uh, not uh, normal because often these kinds of corporations uh, and uh, often uh, die down because uh, some might criticize it or there are new partners or maybe then there are some animosities or there's competition or it get, gets lost in uh, the general um, overwork that we're charged with. And these 20 years document that this is not the case here. We have developed a great format here and this format it serves uh, at the same time um, the learning process, as we all know, but at the same time, uh, we also focus on hot, high priority subjects, uh, things to the young um, discussions and these kinds of discussions 
discussions uh, uh, as uh, these uh, uh, development dis uh, discussion days are uh, often held up uh, by uh, experts, older experts. And this is not the case for this format because it's here, those are the young people who choose the subjects, who prepare the discussions, they ask the questions and it's the young people as well who choose our panelists and invite them. I think it's great because uh, those debates are uh, just led too much by us the older uh, people and uh, now we hand over to the youngsters and I think it's very important um, and very good like this. This is one thing. Uh, so we had also great cooperation with the Heinrich Böll Trust that generally um, invites us uh, to uh, their own um, rooms and invites also uh, the um, postgraduate students and at the same time we also have simultaneous translations and these are the advantages of a digital event um, it uh, takes place for the second time um, meaning uh, uh, Last year, since last year, we uh, the number of um, participants has exploded, and linked to that, there's an automatic internationalization that was impossible to realize um, um, before, uh, and uh, also for many reasons we wouldn't have had the possibility to invite uh, people from all over the world. But in this digital format, we were able to invite people from all over the world. Um, and at the same time, we also have this simultaneous translation um, that, is, that uh, enables us uh, to help hold this event in German and English, uh, meaning that everybody from everywhere can participate. It's also very an inclusive format. Wherever you come from, whatever whichever language you speak, uh, this simultaneous uh, translation is very important. And uh, whatever your budget, whatever the time you need, uh, you also um, save time, travel time. And it's also very inclusive concerning other restrictions that might hinder you from participating. So it's a great advantage to have this digital format. At the same time, I know that I want to go back to the analogous um, event, but others will decide for us, which is fine for me. But uh, when uh, things go very quickly uh, in it was sometimes the controversial debate within one room and also uh, the uh, discourse and exchanges in the coffee breaks uh, for on corporations uh, uh, can only be a po possible in an, an analogous um, event. Uh, so hopefully we will be able to meet again and uh, shake hands and take each other in uh, our arms. Let's get back to our subjects. What are the subjects we mainly uh, try and discuss? Why is are there so many um, subjects concerning rural development? What are the subjects that will link us to the Heinrich the Bill uh, Trust, our colleagues have prepared a word cloud that I'll show to you right now. What you can see here are um, climate protection, uh, prevention of disaster, um, smallholder agriculture, fight against poverty, against, against um, um, development financing, fair trade, etc., etc. There are so many uh, subjects uh, that are discussed in detail with, during the debates and uh, one overall uh, um, uh, uh, subject is development policies and but of course um, the cooperations with the global north and south which concern mainly sub-Sahara Africa that, which are also the focus of international cooperation in the focus uh, are also uh, solution strategies, meaning that we, of course, discuss uh, global subjects and problems. This is uh, our obligation. This is what we want to obtain, but not only concerning the sub problems themselves, but we also treat new, new um, 
a political ideas, meaning a law and a value chains, new um, labels, seals, etc., certifications, new partnerships, for example, the energy partnerships with um, Africa in the framework of the European Green Deal that we will uh, listen to shortly, and that would, but also, for example, digitalization for smallholder farmers. Is that real or, or, or those uh, ideas uh, um, impossible to realize? Uh, uh, so those are uh, um, subjects that are on top of the agenda that are hotly discussed. So we hope that these debates contribute to that these approaches to policies will be focused, will be um, um, enhanced, but that there will be uh, a um, quicker implementation. It is a political um, event here. This is what we uh, want. And with these words, I want to hand over to our um, moderators, Kalin Grassi and Mutori uh, Makansadi. Uh, you have uh, uh, the floor, so we continue in English right now. Many thanks, Susan Neubert and Yogas, for the welcome remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you viewers, wherever you're joining us from. We are glad that you can participate in the first of this year's Development Policy Discussion Days in German Entwicklungs Politische Diskussionstage, or EPDT. My name is Omar Tunde Kasali. My colleagues, Caroline Grassi. Hello. Alexander Kikis. Hello, good morning from my side. And I will be moderating this discussion. We are postgraduate students at the Center for Rural Development at Humboldt University in Berlin. The title of our discussion is Partners in Climate, the Role of African Renewables in the European Green Deal. With this discussion, we want to take a very look at deliberate on and raise awareness on the European Green Deal, or as it's simply called, the Green Deal as it relates to Africa in the energy sector. We intend to have interactive conversations in which the Green Deal is critically evaluated in respect of the stated African aspect, while showing room for maneuver for political, economic, and civil society actors. For the next one and three quarter hours, we'll be having this vital event, discussing this crucial topic together with our invited expert speakers who will be introduced in a moment. Our discussion will be other than two blocks. In the first block, we'll, I shall examine the Green Deal on its merits and consider the potential opportunities and risks it presents to African countries as well as energy partnerships. In the second block, we will be weighing up the implementation of the Green Deal from various perspectives, the role of international development cooperation with Africa and the Green Deal, as well as green hydrogen production and trade. Afterward, our discussants shall be taking questions from the audience. I will now hand over to my colleague, Alexander, who will explain the question management procedure and technical aspects of this event. Alexander. Thank you, Omotunde. A very, very warm welcome also from me. My name is Alexander Kukis, and I will keep an eye <clears throat> on the questions coming in from your side this morning. If you have a question, please proceed to use the Q&A tool below. It's the symbol with the two speech bubbles. Uh, in German, it says F&A, Fragen und Antworten. Please make sure to mention the expert you wish to address, as well as your name, if you like and the organization or institution you're affiliated with. It is also important to mention that this event is recorded and streamed simultaneously on YouTube, where it will be available to watch now and also after we're done here today. By the way, if you are thrilled by what is going on here today and you feel like all of your friends should come on board and watch this too, uh, this uh, is the link that will allow them to join our event this morning. It will lead you straight to the YouTube live stream. I've just posted it in the chat. Of course, live questions can only be answered if you ask them here on Zoom. 
once you see your question and also questions from others in the Q&A window, you can help to rank them by liking individual questions. For this, simply click on the thumbs up symbol and those with a higher approval rate then appear further up in the list and are more likely to be asked by me in the end. We will have around 20 minutes to cover questions across the board, probably starting around 11 o'clock. And needless to say, please be brief and respectful. And as I said, it will be helpful if you already know who of our three guests should be addressed. Feel free to write in English or German. Of course, English will be easier for me. But if you choose German, I will try and summarize it for the panelists in English. Uh, once again, for those who joined us only now, uh, you can choose your preferred language by clicking on the globe symbol below in the task. And in German, uh, für diejenigen, die sich gerade erst dazu geschaltet haben und diese Veranstaltung auf Deutsch hören wollen, Klicken Sie einfach auf das Globus-Symbol unten und wählen Sie Ihre bevorzugte Sprache aus. Next to this globe button, you will find the transcription button with the CC on it. So if you click on it, you can activate closed captions in English. Please note that those are automatically created, so faulty transcriptions are also possible. Last point I will make. Shortly from now, I will post the handout for today's event in the comments. And there will, you will find information on the topic, uh, bios of the speakers, their affiliations, backgrounds, and also a picture. I will now turn off my video and come back on later during the event to pose your questions to the panelists. For now, I'll hand over to my colleague, Caroline, who will carry on with the moderation and will introduce our speakers. Caroline. Thank you, Alexander. In introducing our esteemed panelists, I will be doing so alphabetically with their last names. So I will start with Dr. Hamza Hamushen. Mr. Hamushen is a London-based Algerian researcher activist, a commentator and a founding member of the Algeria Solidarity Campaign, the Environmental Justice North Africa and the North African Food Sovereignty Network. He is currently the North Africa Program Coordinator at the Transnational Institute. His work is focused on issues of extractivism, resources, land and food sovereignty, as well as climate, environmental and trade justice in North Africa. Hamza Hamushen, thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. Our next panelist is Ms. Gabriela Jakobuta. Ms. Jakubuta is a researcher at the German Development Institute. Her research focus is on climate change policies and measures, as well as interactions with other sustainable development areas. Through her research, she aims to support a just transition to climate resilient and low carbon societies in line with the sustainable development goals. She recently pu published three policy briefs on EU-Africa relations in the context of the European Green Deal. Ms. Jakubuta is currently finalizing her PhD titled Enablers of Ambitious Climate Action at Wageningen Uni University and Research. Ms. Gabriela Jakubuta, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me here. Our final panelist is Mr. Tobias Lechtenfeld. Mr. Lechtenfeld is Senior Policy Officer at the BMZ, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. After completing his PhD in economics and politics, he started working at the World Bank, where he served as a technical advisor for local enterprise financing in the Middle East and North Africa region. Currently at the BMZ, he works as the department at the Department for Cooperation with the Private Sector, Sustainable Economic Policy. There he oversees the expansion of the hydrogen economy and is responsible for the strategic partnership on technology with Africa. Mr. Tobias Lechtenfeld, thank you for joining us, especially so spontaneously, as the previous speaker had to cancel on short notice. You can switch on your camera now. Camera is still not working, but uh, thank you, thank you, Sarah, of course, for the for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Here it goes. And um, yeah, welcome everyone. Good morning. Thank you. At this point, I would like to mention that our team tried hard to get on board a representative of the European Union, which is 
primarily responsible for the Green Deal. Unfortunately, we did not succeed, so please bear with us. However, we still have an excellent panel with our three speakers here today and looking forward to the event. Now that we know our speakers and the moderation team, we are ready to dive into our discussion properly. And before we do so, we shall begin by showing a video that provides a brief general introduction into the Green Deal to set the, set the stage for our discussion. Climate change induced by human activities is one of the most urgent challenges of our time. An important driver is the growing concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Especially countries of the global north have a carbon-intensive way of life and contribute enormously to the crisis. To tackle this problem, the European Commission has presented the European Green Deal in December 2019. The aim of the deal is for Europe to become the first climate-neutral continent by 2050. By that time, the greenhouse gas emissions shall be reduced to a level which can be naturally balanced, for example, through sinks like forests or moorlands. The European Green Deal is a strategic roadmap which sets out policies in various fields, from energy supply, transportation to the building sector and food systems. But how tangible is the European Green Deal now? In April 2021, the European Council and Parliament negotiated a provisional agreement on the European climate law to turn the commitment of the Green Deal into legal obligations. However, the law still has to go through further formal stages and be fully approved by Parliament and Council as well as be ratified by its member states. In total, the Green Deal strives to mobilize at least 1 trillion euros until 2030 from the EU budget as well as public and private investments. For the protection of regions that strongly depend on fossil fuels, 100 billion euros shall be provided under the Just Transition Mechanism that aims to leave no one behind. Let's broaden the view. The EU Green Deal not only impacts the EU member states, but also people and ecosystems around the world. A European emission reduction would thus mitigate consequences of climate change worldwide. But these reductions can only be achieved by a considerable expansion of clean energy solutions. However, these cannot be produced in Europe alone and more attention is given to non-European countries with large green energy potential. In line with the Green Deal, for example, Germany foresees the intensification of energy partnerships worldwide to secure its energy needs. At the center of these partnerships is green hydrogen, which needs water and renewable energies for its production. The use of hydrogen is multifunctional, either directly as a drive for mobility and an industry or as an energy storage medium. Thanks to these features, hydrogen is considered the oil of the future. With its geographical potential in wind, water and sun energy, African countries are particularly considered as partners in climate. The partnership with Morocco has gained special momentum in recent years, and other agreements have been added in the course of the deal, like the Democratic Republic of Congo with its STEM project. Since Germany is among the world leaders in hydrogen technologies and provides technical cooperation in the African countries with promise in energy capacities, these partnerships should actually be a win-win situation for everyone. But is that really the case? To approach this question, we need to take up the debate around climate justice. Climate justice is a concept and movement that addresses climate change with social and economic consequences and not just as an ecological challenge. In particular, countries that have not significantly contributed to the climate crisis suffer disproportionately from its effects. In relation to the Green Deal, the following questions arise. Who particularly benefits and who might be negatively affected by these partnerships? And how can climate justice be ensured in the implementation of the Green Deal? In the end, to become a true game changer, the European Green Deal needs tangible implementation and an insurance of climate justice for all involved partners around the globe. Now that we have seen this video explainer on the Green Deal, we would like to kick off this discussion by getting brief opening statements from our speakers. 
Distinguished panelists, we would like you to describe the Green Deal in one word from your respective perspectives and tell us why you chose this word. Ms. Jakubucha, I would like to start with you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I would describe it using the word interlinkages. And this is because uh, the, the transformation to carbon neutrality and also to a sustainable development world that uh, the EU Green Deal is trying to achieve requires a diff, deep social um, economic transformation. And this has huge implications across sectors and not only uh, domestically, but also for other countries. So with many transboundary effects. Thank you, Ms. Jakobuta. Mr. Hamushen, it's your turn. How would you describe the Green Deal in one word? Um, for me, the European Green Deal or any other Green Deal for that matter um, must be decolonial or it won't be adequate. Um, it won't work until it dismantles the neo neocolonial structures exploiting nature and people. It needs to address the power relations and the hierarchies of the international food and energy systems that are rooted in colonial and neo-colonial legacies, as well as practices of dispossession, um, plunder of resources, land grabs, um, uh, especially in the global south, including in the African continent. So we have a global economy with unequal and uneven trade patterns with a tendency um, to externalize social and environmental costs onto poor racialized and gender bodies, especially in the global South. So this destructive economy must be decolonized and radically overhauled. Otherwise the green and renewable transformations in the global South will be derailed as countries like Morocco, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo or Bolivia will be forced to continue producing and exporting to, to, the Europe, uh, to Europe, including continuing those dangerous extractivist um, pol uh, pol policies or to extract coltan, cobalt, lithium, and other minerals uh, important for um, the energy technologies. So if we don't decolonize, we will be just greening those dynamics that still very much dominate relations between developed and developing countries. So um, in that respect, for me, the European Green Deal is woefully inadequate and seriously flawed as it doesn't challenge, challenge the root causes of the problem. And I hope we'll have more time to, to delve into this in the discussion. Definitely, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hamushen. Let's turn to Mr. Lechtenfeld. One word that describes the Green Deal for you. I'd probably choose the word hope um, for two reasons. I think it's it's very, very clear that you know energy, the, the climate change we cannot be mastered without any global energy transition. We're currently using way too much energy on this planet, um, especially in the in the global north, but also increasingly in, in transition economies in the global south. Um, we know that by burning fossil fuels, you know, it, we we cause more and more and more of the climate change. So at the same time, I think we realize that energy is key and is perhaps a decisive basis for economic and, and social development. And you know, a sustainable needs-based energy supply for all people must therefore be climate neutral. And I think this is the challenge we're looking at in the very short term that needs to be solved um, and around the world, but especially also in emerging economies and, and poorer countries. And so the energy sector has a major impact on climate and it produces what two thirds of all greenhouse gases um, that are harmful for the climate worldwide. Um, the numbers are going down because we're expanding renewables, but it's, it's still a major, major source. Um, you know, and we see that at the same time, developing emerging countries in particular, they need more and more energy. Global demand for primary energy itself could increase by, by over a third by 2040 alone. So that's, that's a very daunting outlook if we just look at the number of, let's say, coal plants, you know, energy plants that are, that are aiming to burn coal, etc. So, with that in mind, and also still realizing that still one in eight people worldwide still lack access to electricity, um, you know, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa alone, it's 600 million people. Um, we're 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 really being 
well, we find ourselves in a situation that is, is, a, is a big stretch in that sense, I think, if we are able to use the, the political momentum and the financial momentum that can come from the European Green Deal to advance not just any energy supply, but renewable energy supply, we're actually building a foundation for a much more sustainable future, for a, for a much more um, positive future with, with economic opportunities uh, for all people around this planet and, um, and a, a future where climate change can actually be tackled. And, how to do that and to ensure that it's just, to ensure that there are strong governance systems, to ensure that you know, um, certain practices of the past um, are discontinued. I think this is the real challenge in the implementation, but I think overall it provides an opportunity. And I would, I would use the word hope to describe um, the opportunity that we're given at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lechtenfeld. Interlinkages, decolonize and hope. These, these three terms show how multifaceted the Green Deal is or how it should be and how differently it is received. Um, and with these impressions, I hand over to you, Umatunde. Now, beyond these general impressions of the Green Deal, we are specifically interested in this panel discussion in what the Green Deal means for Africa, including the risks and opportunities it presents to Africa. Ms. Yakubuta, the Green Deal is primarily discussed as an European project. However, the EU can only achieve its goals if it builds strong international partnerships that help to promote green transitions globally, including with Africa. Can, can you please tell us in concrete terms what the Green Deal means for Africa-EU relations in the field of energy? Ms. Yakubuta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Casali. Uh, indeed, the EU cannot achieve the, the Green Deal without partnerships, without support uh, from, uh, without development, well, without cooperation with other countries. Uh, but with regards to Africa, there are opportunities and there are also important risks that uh, would need to be addressed, as already have been pointed out, some of them by uh, Mr. Hamuchene. But first of all, we, we have to um, you know, put it out there uh, up front that the two continents come from very different angles. Um, uh, first, you know, the uh, EU, um, it's uh, made up of countries that are highly developed and with much higher capacity to make this transition, but also countries who are uh, highly responsible for the current climate, climate crisis historically. On the other hand, Africa has less capacity for action in that sense, but its countries are also going to be highly affected by climate change uh, with uh, all sorts of negative effects uh, also on food security, for instance. Um, However, I see the Green Deal as a great opportunity um, uh, for very fruitful collaboration between uh, Africa and the EU, because this will help them tackle a common issue, a common challenge uh, that is relevant to both countries, um, uh, to, sorry, to both continents. The EU uh, Green Deal is having a strong language around development uh, cooperation, so it recognizes uh, the importance of it. It also talks about the importance of providing finance, um, among others, and, and uh, supporting transformations uh, abroad that would then support also the implementation of the Green Deal. And I would see it as a, as a great opportunity for joint learning between Africa and the EU to transition to sustainable development and low carbon societies. I must say that uh, not the EU and nor Africa have tested an actual model for such a big transformation and for moving to, to low carbon and, and sustainable societies. So this is a great chance for them to move together, to do this together, and also um, you know, uh, end up representing a model for um, uh, international, for also for other countries to um, make such partnerships. Um, for that, they would have to focus on the synergies. There are lots of uh, benefits of the sustainable transformation. There are job opportunities. Uh, there's an opportunity for economic growth, for boosting uh, the industry, for improving health, environmental protection, and also for ensuring economic competitiveness as the world is moving towards um, increased standards uh, for sustainability. 
and so on. This will be important for everyone to ensure there are no uh, lockdowns into fossil fuels. Um, for Africa, this is extremely important, uh, the, the EU Green Deal, because the EU uh, is Africa's biggest partner from a trade perspective, uh, and about a third of the exports and a third of the imports uh, between um, uh, from Africa to Europe and, uh, sorry, third of Africa's exports to Europe uh, go to Europe and a third of its imports come from Europe. But there are also lots of link, uh, risks that need to be acknowledged. Um, the EU has, for instance, seen the risk of carbon leakage uh, as a result of its EU Green Deal. And for that uh, purpose, it, wanted, it wants to implement a carbon border, a border adjustment mechanism. However, this mechanism is more likely to have negative effects on developing countries because we know for now that uh, OECD countries tend to be importers of uh, carbon, while um, developing countries tend to be exporters uh, of carbon overall, um, net uh, importers and exporters. So this could be a, a high risk for Africa if it does not manage to um, decarbonize its um, economy, but also because half of the exports from Africa to the EU are represented by fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel energy. So that's, that's massive. And if the EU is moving away from fossil fuels, then it's a question what is going to happen with Africa. So that's on the energy side. There are also issues uh, on, for instance, the circular economy, um, as was mentioned by uh, Mr. Hamuchene, what will happen? How are they going to address potential issues of extractivism? Uh, or if the EU will be able to ensure proper labor rights uh, and safety. Um, in the agriculture, uh, if the EU imposes strong standards, how is that going to work in Africa uh, with different um, climatic conditions and different pest conditions? Uh, is, is Africa going to manage to, to provide those products? Um, of course, there's also issues of land grabbing in terms of biodiversity protection. And there's also the question of what uh, the two are focusing on, because also if you read the EU Green Deal, um, the EU is focusing on mitigation while uh, Africa is highly interested in adaptation. Uh, and thank, thank you so much for your response, uh, Ms. Yakubuta. We would uh, touch upon uh, some of the points you mentioned later in the discussion. Now, I would like us to um, discuss uh, briefly about uh, green colonialism. Now, uh, Mr. Amushin, um, the Green Deal implies that African countries, not least in North Africa, would develop green energy for their own needs, as well as for export to Europe. You've previously criticized uh, the former and strong terms such as um, um, extractivism and uh, green colonialism. Do you think it, the Green Deal is about green colonialism as well? Or is there the chance for the Green Deal to provide environment-friendly economic opportunities for some African countries? Uh, this is um, a complex question and it's really hard to answer in two or three minutes, but um, I'll give it a go. Um, for me, the, the important framing in this discussion, uh, which I use uh, in my work and in my activism, is just transition. Um, transition is inevitable. It has become inevitable. Those discussions have become mainstream after decades of uh, climate denialism, after decades of complaints, uh, complacency from the industrialized nations. So now it has become a mainstream. And in that respect, this is positive. So we see all this talk about Green New Deals uh, in North America, the Green Deal in Europe, and the renewable energy. So this is, this is positive. So I said, transition is inevitable, but justice is not. Um, so how do we make this transition towards renewable energy just for everybody? And in this respect, we cannot depoliticize the discussion. We need to talk about global structures of power, about hierarchies that are rooted in colonial and neo-colonial legacies. Uh, when I talk about neo-colonial legacies, I mean trade relations, relations of domination, who owns what, who, who provides what, who produces what. So these questions are, are, are really important. So for me, one, one like a simple look at the, the European Green Deal 
um, seems like it leaves the intact, it leaves intact the basic economic structure. It's, it relies heavily on green growth and unlimited consumption. So it seems like for the Green Deal or the people who wrote that European Green Deal that by putting green in front of growth, it makes it sustainable, which is not the case. We have limited resources. The planet has boundaries. And if we maintain this obsession on a limited growth and endless consumption, um, that sustainability won't be achieved. So that's why for me, it's important to come back to, the, to that notion of um, mastering nature, which is a Eurocentric notion. We need to master nature whose only role is to provide unlimited um, resources for the accumulation of capital. And we need to question those ideas. And if we don't, the same thing would be reproduced. We will be seeing green colonialism. We will be seeing countries in the global south continuing extractive activities in order to produce lithium batteries for European cars. So that's why we need to put in this discussion at the center stage, the economic question, global economic justice. Um, so I, I hope I answered a little bit, I touched a little bit, but then we can go deeper into the discussion later on. Yeah, many thanks. Uh... Mr. Amushin, uh, those are key points, and uh, I would like to use um, you know some of them uh, to uh, pose the next, co next question to Mr. Lechtenfeld. Um, Mr. Lechtenfeld, the Green Deal envisages a green energy partnership between the EU, um, its member states including Germany, and its uh, partner countries and regions um, including Africa. However, as we read. Um, around 50% of African countries' exports into the EU are fossil fuel exports. Can one then say the Green Deal poses an economic risk to African states in this respect, or rather that provides an economic opportunity for African countries to seek a green energy transition? Mr. Lechtenfeld. Thank you so much, and I think it's 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 a really an excellent question, and also a question that um, I'm sure not only here in Berlin but also in, in Brussels, policymakers are are you know debating very very intensely on how to how to solve that. Um, I think the challenges that we see actually on on several dimensions, and um, while I cannot speak on behalf of the European Union, I can certainly share the thinking you know in the Ministry for Economic uh, Development Cooperation here in, in Germany. Um, I think what's very, very important is because you have so many objectives that you're trying to maximize at the same time, we, we would like to see, you know, more energy being provided in African countries. So they you increase electrification, so you increase economic development um, in, in partner countries. At the same time, of course, the climate threat is a global threat, and we need to decarbonize the entire global economy, not just one country or one sector. And um, and that, of course, you know, forces people to think very hard on on how to do that. And where, I mean, just to start with the energy sector, where to get all the energy from, and, and new fuels, etc. So you already have two objectives that seem that seem uh, opposed, or at least uh, conflicting each other. Then, of course, you have that big um, wish and and ambition, and, and I think rightly so, of, of leaders um, around the world, and, and especially in poor nations, that say, well. We want to catch up. We want our people to also live in economic prosperity. We, we, we want to give our best to you know, make our countries um, successful um, you know, in the global market or certainly within the, the local context. And I think that's, that's something that will require more and more energy. And so you see a drive for electrification first, no matter what's the CO2 footprint of it. And that's why we see hundreds I think some people say thousands. I'm, I'm not sure what the most reliable number is, but certainly hundreds uh, of coal plants being planned and being in the in the pipelines. I mean, as in, in construction, you know, for the coming years, and that's of course horrific. You know, if you think of, of the climate uh, crisis that we're facing, and um, 
And then, of course, you have vested interest. I think there's no doubt about that. You know, whether it's uh, someone owning a coal mine, um, why? You know, of course, their interest is to to ensure that gets exploited and, uh, and and you know, so they they can you know reap profits from that. And and that's I think it's very very problematic that you have these these, these intermix of, um, of of private interest, global interest, national interest. And it's very, very hard to say, well, here's the one blueprint that gets us through all of this, right? There isn't. I don't think there's a single blueprint. I think what's important is that we have standards that we hold and standards that we do not question. And I think one standard that BMZ is holding, and I think it's, it's very right to do so, is to say, whatever we do when it comes to you know, exporting energy from Africa to Europe, we must ensure additionality. So it must be on top of any energy that's being provided locally. So there's no, what we call here, canalization. So they, you, you cannot take the energy away from a nation that is not even fully electrified for your own, you know, whatever noble purpose you might have. And I think that's a standard we're, we're very, very strong on and we're not willing to in any way, you know, just move one inch. And I think that's really, really important um, also to recognize. So we say energy security first, water security first. Someone mentioned green hydrogen production and, and you know you need groundwater or you need water for that. And so well why not use seawater and desalinate? You know, you don't need to you don't need to use a country, whether it's Morocco or or some other nation that has water scarcity, you know, you don't want to drain the natural resources there. So sustainable development remains the guarding the, the, you know, the, the guiding light, the, the North Star, so to speak, on which we, we orient ourselves as we work. And, uh, and I've been sitting in some of these debates with whether it's the private sector or even with, with foreign governments and foreign governments are saying, well, but we are willing to export more energy because we make more money if we sell your, our energy to Europe than if we sell it to our own people. And we're like, no, but that's not how we're gonna do it. We will not take your energy just because you offer it unless you show that you're increasing electrification. Now, maybe I'm already diving too deep into the practicalities of, of how this rolls out, but I just, you know, I'm really trying to show that it is very, very complex. And I think the only thing that can, that can get us to a better world, uh, both on climate, both on economic development um, in, in Africa, if you want to focus on the continent, but also, you know, achieving the, the, the much, much needed decarbonization in Europe, is by having standards. And I think what I would love to do is focus some of the discussion today on what additional standards or which, which the, what are these standards that could be. I mean, we're focusing on environmental and social safeguards, I think the classic set. Um, on top, we have certain standards that are related to, to the water resources, as I mentioned. Um, but perhaps that's one way also of, of looking at it. So, I mean, it's not, is it a threat or an opportunity? Well, we can shape it to become an opportunity. If we do it right, and I think that's that's how yeah, what, what I think we can hopefully all all um, discuss today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lichtenfeld, for those uh, key insights. So um, risk opportunity it depends on how uh, you shape it. Um, now we have uh, spoken about uh, the opportunities and risks that are partnerships between the EU and Africa foreseen in the Green Deal can offer. However, it is vital that we have a closer look at the partnerships themselves. And for this, I will now hand over to my colleague, Caroline, to guide us through this. Caroline. So, Mr. Hamushen, um, energy partnerships are carried out by different national and international institutions working at the local level. Um, I'm interested now in like who is shaping the discourse and also the standards that Mr. Lechtenfeld just mentioned around renewable energies in North Africa and how? That's, that's a very good question. Um, and it goes at the heart of what, what I'm trying to say, who is shaping the discourse, who is shaping that discussion, who has you know, the hegemony over, over those conversations. During my years of work in, in the North African context, especially around energy democracy, energy sovereignty, especially in Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco, um, I saw that the, 
the dominant entities in those discussions are fin international financial institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, as well as European agencies and European corporations, um, and also the US and, and so on. Um, they, they might sound neutral in what they say, uh, pushing for renewable energy, um, saying that we need, we need to push for that transition and doing all that kind of partnerships with, with governments in, in, in the global south, including in North Africa. But, but they are not neutral. They are aligned with the powerful. They are aligned with big capital. They are, they are, they are aligned with corporations. So their transition is corporate driven uh, and is geared towards the privatizations of natural resources, the privatization of water, the privatization of renewable energy. I just give you an example. So I've written a, a, about the solar, uh, what is that? The what is that solar plant in Morocco that has been championed in 2016 as the largest solar plant in the world. And it sounds wonderful that Morocco is taking, is taking that step, which is, which is a positive step. But you look, you scratch under the surface and you look at the details of the project and you'll find it's privately owned. You find that it contracted huge debts, $9 billion with Moroccan guarantees. So if that project fails, it's the Moroccan people who will be paying, adding much more burden on, on, uh, on them. And then when you look at, let's say the green credentials of the project, uh, it uses the CSP uh, te technology, which necessitates a lot of water. And that solar plant is built in an arid region uh, in a water po a poor country, adding more water stress. So it's not, it's not really that green. And then it is built on the land of agro pastoralist communities with their, without their approval. And they don't see the benefits till today. So it's these, these projects that we need to delve into, into the details and to see if they are really benefiting the local communities. Uh, it might benefit a certain ruling elite or ruling class in Morocco, or maybe certain urban populations, but those rural populations are not benefiting from that transition. That's why I always emphasize the word justice. And I emphasize the questions, who owns what? Who does what? Who gets what? And whose benefit is being served by these projects? And, and in here comes international financial institution, comes big corporation, and these are only interested in making Profits, not really interested in the renewable energy. They can make green capitalism, right? It has been based on fossil fuels for a long time. They've been extracting and plundering the resources and polluting and destroying the environments and livelihoods of people for a long time. It can continue under the guise of green growth and green and green capitalism. So, Thank you, Mr. Hamushin. Yeah. If I may interrupt you here, um, I'd be interested in the opinion of Mr. Lechtenfeld. Um, Mr. Hamushin, because you mentioned um, different international institutions leading the discourse and maybe also setting some sort of standards. Now I'd be interested um, to hear your opinion, Mr. Lichtenfeld. How can these international institutions maybe also aligned with the private sector, um, use their privileges in a way that can benefit people in countries where renewable energies or these large projects are implemented? Um, sure, um, again, I, I don't think I can speak for international financial institutions. Um, you know, I'm, I think that would not be, not be correct, but I think what I, what I can say is that, so, the development world um, is governed by social environmental standards, safer standards. Now, there has been a lot of debate um, to make them more, to, to widen them. And I think there's, um, uh, personally, I would support some of these, these, these requests or, or proposals. I think what is important though, if I, if I look at a plant, for example, the hydrogen plant that the German government is, is um, you know, supporting in Morocco uh, and that's being financed through the Moroccan government. There will be, of course, you know, 
often when you have investments, whether it's for road building or whether it's for, for energy provision, you need land. And of course, if somebody owns this land, there has to be a compensation plan and it has to be validated. And if there's claimants that are um, arguing that they haven't been fully compensated, then there is a settlement mechanism. Now, of course, it is much harder, and you know, I don't think we want to be naive here, to, to enforce that and to really have a, that solidly working in, in countries with low governance structures or weak governance structures rather compared to those with stronger governance structures and um, now since we can't really what can I say um, so ideally we would want to work only in countries with extremely strong governance structures that are very inclusive that are very very uh, democratic that are very very robust when it comes to um, also the economics so that when that, whatever financing happens um, you know, there's an investment safety, so you can actually pull in resources to get more done. Now, the challenge that we face is, of course, that most countries that have those conditions over an extended period no longer need any support. So we will, as a development community, we will almost always find ourselves in countries that face certain degrees of challenges. And so it's much more, you know, I think, well, in, in principle, I agree with many of the things that have been said, in practice, we don't have a choice. We can only work with incentives. We can work with support. We can work with uh, with carrots. We cannot work with sticks. You know, to use that image. I mean, it is twenty twenty one, right? So for for the long, for decades and decades, we have ensured that development cooperation is free of any any pressure, is free of any, any you know uh, conditionalities. And yet again and again, we're hearing, well, but you need to ensure this and you need to force this and you need to force that and it just doesn't square. So we work in, in joint areas of collaboration. If you wanna see, you know, if you use a graphic image, it's, it's intersecting circles. So what is, what is what we propose and what we are willing to do under the under development framework and what is a partnering government um, willing to accept? And of course, we will do our utmost to ensure transparency when it comes to the use of resources. So there's you know, the risk of corruption is, is reduced to, to a minimum. But again, I mean, we would be naive to say, well, you know, we will ensure that there is no corruption. We will ensure, you cannot, you know. Yeah, sure. Anyone who has worked in a project knows this and, and that worked on the ground, you know, with communities, it is extremely difficult. And so I think the question is much more, how do we set, how do we collaborate globally and how do we also ensure that you have you, you activate mechanisms so i think for the german government is very very important to say well every collaboration also brings the opportunity to move closer to work closer to to know each other better to establish trusted relationships and then you can bring in local watchdogs that you support you can bring in you know local um you know, if you look at a parliamentary system, you don't just work exclusively with, let's say, one, one ruling uh, group, but you bring in also a, a, you know, a, a hundred groups, things like that. So you have ways to 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 strengthen the local governance system over time. Um, but a priori, uh, to begin with, we don't really have a choice to, you know, our partner countries are independent, they're sovereign, and, and we have to respect that. And I think it's very important that we do respect that. Yeah, uh, one, thank one, you, Mr. Lechtenfeld, if I may interrupt you here. So you mentioned um, again the the importance of setting joint standards and uh, collaborating, and also you mentioned issues or questions around practicability. And so, um, especially in that regard, Ms. Jakobucha, um, I'd be interested in your opinion regarding carbon offsets because in the short run it is cheaper to compensate for emissions outside of Europe than reducing emissions in the EU. Um, which role do African partner countries play in achieving net zero emissions in the EU energy sector, especially regarding carbon offsets? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a very good question uh, because this, yeah, this has been a contested issue quite often um, due to yeah, questions of land grab uh, outside and also now there's lots of debates uh, for 
the Article 6, the so-called Article 6 on carbon markets under the Paris Agreement, uh, where countries are yet to decide on how to move forward. Um, some of the countries are interested in double counting uh, emission reductions, uh, so counting them uh, domestically, but then also internationally. Um, so this will, of course, also be something that needs to be addressed in Africa. Um, and as Mr. Lechtenfeld has also highlighted, uh, of course, there has to be strong standards from the EU and uh, the EU has to ensure that such trade-offs are not um, uh, going to become a, a problem. Um, but at the same time, it also needs the support of African countries in that sense. Um, in terms of yeah, in terms of offsetting, it's always the question of additionality, right? And uh, what would happen otherwise if um, if the EU would not invest in renewables supporting uh, developing countries? So investing for offset ab abroad, would those countries really not invest in renewables themselves? In many cases, we know that the way that they are moving ahead now is carbon, uh, sorry, um, uh, coal and, and natural gas. There's also uh, lots of uh, natural gas resources in, in Africa and countries are uh, interested in exploiting those more. And uh, there are also other African countries that have uh, discovered oil and gas uh, recently like uh, Niger, for instance, Kenya and others. So it's a question, are they going to use it or not? At the same time, we must say that both the EU and Africa, so not just the EU, but also Africa has made a, a clear statement that they are willing to address SDG 7 on energy and to move towards renewables, for instance, in uh, the 2063 agenda of the African Union, uh, where this is one of the goals. So yeah, that uh, that would be uh, that would be a question in that regard. Um, also, taking into account that Africa is very rich in renewables, and that uh, renewables are now cost competitive with fossil fuels, and in some cases, in some countries, even cheaper than fossil fuels in Africa. So the, the issue is more political vested interest, I would say, in some cases, but also path dependencies. They just don't know, uh, you know, how to move forward with something new, and they kind of follow the, the traditional way. Now, thank you very much. Many of the aspects you mentioned, I'm sure we'll um, pick them up at the later point in the discussion. And having explored now opportunities and risks, as well as the role of energy related partnerships between African and European countries, we will now show a brief video which projects voices of people from Nigeria, Morocco, Ethiopia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And they share their own opinions and standpoints on energy related aspects of the Green Deal and thus represent one out of many voices of their respective countries. Let's start the video. Climate neutrality is the goal. But however, for my country, Nigeria, it is far fetched owing to the fact that we still run a fossil dominated economy. To make this ambitious leap, we have to consider Nigeria, like many African countries, are yet to undergo industrialization. And with industrialization comes an extensive use of energy. If we impose climate neutrality and cut carbon um, budgeting, it will stifle Nigeria's growth and development. And since the world's net zero ambition requires or perhaps demands a concerted effort, it is highly likely that Africa will be left behind. As one of the few organizations working in this field, I would say it's a classic injustice. The European Green Deal should strive to deliver localized energy access pathways to speed up transition with not just technology and resource. We should also consider stakeholders engagement and inclusion for youth and children, particularly because it is in this decade that children will become the youth. So we need to also consider consumer choice and education. We need to cons um, imbue public perception, localize policies and navigate individualistic inc incentives other than just feeding tariffs to encourage the increase of carbon tax to benefit their accelerated adoption of sustainable uh, energy. Je crois que ces accords doivent absolument prendre en compte les mesures d'adaptation initiées localement par le pays, les enjeux et impacts sur la relance économique du Maroc en mettant en avant la lutte conjointe des deux parties 
contre le changement climatique, ainsi que l'impact de leurs efforts communs en faveur de la transition énergétique vers une économie propre dans les domaines promoteurs. Concernant le Maroc, il y a lieu d'évoquer la question de l'efficacité énergétique à travers des mesures permettant l'économie dans les domaines du transport, de la valorisation des déchets, la consommation durable de l'eau et des ressources naturelles, ainsi que la mise en œuvre des engagements internationaux, les NDC, pour faire face au changement climatique, sans pour autant négliger les engagements y afférents aux EDD à l'horizon 2030. Les potentialités en termes des limites de financement du degré de développement des infrastructures et de maîtrise des technologies et la protection des ressources naturelles pour la protection des innovations ne doivent pas être négligées dans la conclusion des accords de partenariat. In Ethiopia, more than 60% of the population are living without access to re reliable energy and electricity access. However, there are plenty of energy generation potential in the country, mainly from renewable sources. It is a good move by the government, the administration, to attract so many private sectors from the international markets. I strongly suggest the European investors to come to Ethiopia and invest in the renewable energy sector that benefits the investors and the community by supporting access to electricity with renewable sources, improving the life of marginalized community and reducing carbon emission. It will also promote the current economic development programs of the country. Et ici, pour parler des opportunités, je dirais que le, la plus grande opportunité est celui de voir l'amélioration euh, de l'accès des populations africaines à l'électricité. Et je pourrais vous parler de la RDC, qui est un pays avec un potentiel énorme, mais à peine 8% de population a accès à l'électricité. Donc le développement euh, des énergies renouvelables présente une opportunité dans la mesure où cela se fait très rapidement avec des coûts abordables, euh, la population où carrément il y aura production de plusieurs mégawatts où carrément la population aura accès à l'électricité. Mais comme défi, euh, ici je dirais les impacts, parce que je pourrais prendre le cas de, du projet INGA, qui voudrait, euh, Grand Inga donc, euh, qui pourrait être développé en RDC avec une capacité de production de plus de 40 000 mégawatts. Euh, et l'Europe, euh, à travers l'Allemagne, l'Union européenne, estime que ce projet pourra produire de l'hydrogène. Et justement, l'hydrogène est considéré comme une énergie verte. Mais le problème, c'est que le, la, le, le modèle ou le, le, la production même de cette énergie ou de cet hydrogène n'est-ce pas, va impacter beaucoup des communautés en termes d'environnement, de, d'économie, du social. Et c'est des impacts énormes que nous craignons à travers ce genre de partenariat. Et pour une amélioration, certes, de ce genre de partenariat, nous estimons que leur développement doit se faire avec la participation massive des Africains, dans la mesure où on peut évaluer ensemble le risque et voir dans quelle mesure résoudre ce problème. Je vous remercie. With this video, we now move to the second part of the discussion, which will be about the politics around hydrogen production and trade, the role of international development cooperation and the implementation of the Green Deal. I would like to start with uh, Mr. Lichtenfeld. Mr. Lichtenfeld, are you there? Okay, so uh, it should be about uh, green hydrogen as the last uh, speaker mentioned. Uh, with uh, solar or hydropower, green hydrogen can be produced and transported to Europe. Now there are debates about how energy efficient this process is and whether it will be worthwhile. The question is, how do you evaluate the role of green hydrogen produced in Africa for the decarbonization of European economies? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for the the question, and that's. I think it's a very um. It's a very important topic. I think it's a very timely topic. Um. So regarding the efficiency of of hydrogen production, 
or even e-fuels or synthetic fuels that you can produce and from green hydrogen. I think there's no doubt that is, it is by probably one of the least efficient ways of producing those things. And that means we should only do it when we have no other choice. Um, so if the objective is to stop the climate crisis first and foremost, because no, no other development objective currently is as important as, as the climate crisis, that means we need to decarbonize the economy in the North and the South everywhere. Now, if that's the pathway to take, then the question is really which forms of decarbonization are feasible from an energy perspective, but also affordable from an economic perspective. And, and given that hydrogen is both fairly inefficient to produce and, and uh, fairly expensive to produce, as already was pointed out here, it can only and should only, from a political perspective, it should only be used for sectors or applications where you have no alternative. So for example, if you think of um, car mobility, right? Driving, local mobility, you can use um, other sources of renewable energy. You don't need to go the hydrogen route. However, if you're thinking of, of uh, ferries, vessels, shipping, um, those kind of boat engines, it's very difficult to come up with any other form of renewable fuel there that is not um, at least ammonia based or, or methanol based. Now, without going into the chemistry of all these products, um, basically what the way how we're looking at it is that we've, we've sort of ranked the different applications. So we know everything that needs to be decarbonized and we're looking very hard for what is the most sustainable energy source or most efficient energy source that can be used to decarbonize, to decarbonize that. And of course, we're not doing that by ourselves. I mean, we have, have leading international groups like the IPCC, um, you know, uh, et cetera, that, that are basically recommending which form of energy to use for which um, sector, for which application. And if we follow that very strictly, we realize that the total need for, for sustainable fuels, for sustainable energy is so much larger than, than we have available today, right? I mean, we're talking about renewable energy for the last 20 years, and we are barely, barely getting into the, you know, we're not even close to half of the global energy supply being decarbonized, but that's only a fraction of the total CO2 footprint. What about industry? What about mobility? We, we be, we're just starting to decarbonize those parts. And that's, this is where green hydrogen comes in. And um, so the question is more about how do we organize, we as a, as a people on this planet, how does the planet organize global supply? Um, not just for Germany or not just for Europe, it's, it's, you know, the question I think is much, much bigger. And you see countries like Chile is saying, well, you know, we're um, an emerging economy. We have great conditions. We are ready and available to supply parts of Asia because they have a, you know, much larger demand even or, or requirement than we do. And I think that's an, that's an interesting case because there it is really the government taking charge, um, you know, negotiating the contracts, um, making sure you have you know royalty so that benefits stay in the country now is it error proof no of course not you still need to make sure that you have you know um benefit sharing mechanisms whether through taxation or social services whether it's social you know expanding the social welfare system in these countries um so that not individual you know so that not individuals um run away basically with all the profits to to, to use a very simplified image here um and that's in the mechanics of doing it. And I know that, I don't know if that, that's answering a question, but I'm just trying to point to the direction that it's, it's um, we will only use hydrogen or we will only support the use of hydrogen in the most urgent cases. Thank you for your opinion on Mr. Lechmikod. Now, uh, I'm interested in your opinion, Mr. Amashen, and I would like to get your reaction to the hydrogen uh, question, especially as uh, this uh, material as, uh, in a massive potential, especially in North Africa. Now, do you share the belief that uh, green hydrogen is promising, especially in its relevance for EU Africa energy trade relations, where green hydrogen is imported from Africa to Europe? Thanks for this question. I'm not. I'm not going to claim that I'm an expert in green hydrogen. I'm still learning about it day after day it sounds like an interesting technology um but I, I just would like to make some general 
comments um, around the question of technology. Um, because we need always to ask the question, for what purpose are we using this technology? And who owns, who owns that technology and for what agenda? These questions are really primordial in contexts in the global south, in North Africa, in Morocco, and so on. Um, my problem with the way that technology is being presented in, let's say, the European Green Deal or other initiatives like Desert Tech, for example. I, I've, I've written about Desert Tech initiative uh, five years ago, um, criticizing it because of that plan. They were um, to export renewable energy from solar and wind to Europe through the electrical grid, but that did not work. Now it is being revamped through that you know, hydrogen technology, and they are planning even to export it through the gas pipelines, the current infrastructure. I don't know, that, there are a lot of criticism around this when it comes to cost, feasibility, and so on. But I'd like to just to, to make some um, political points because those are tech, techno fixes. And our imaginary, at least the dominant imaginary right now to, in the energy transition is let's, let's just go to technology. Technology will um, solve all our problems, geoengineering, those technical fixes, those me mega projects. But in reality, they don't go to the heart of the problem. They don't question our destructive production models. Uh, when it comes to food, when it comes to industry, with all the externalities that these models are generating. And it gives the, those techno fixes give the illusion that there is a limited availability of energy and in a way indirectly perpetuates um, the consumerist Western model. Uh, it perpetuates the profligate use of energy consumption Basically, it doesn't challenge the status quo. It just tells us, let's continue living in the old ways and let's just change the energy source from oil and gas and coal to renewables. And I have a problem with that. Let's question you know, all, all this because all these techno fixes present the idea that we are all in it together. They don't provide um, you know, details on the economic and political context of those countries, like in North Africa, uprisings and revolutions have been taking place in the last 10 years, challenging that neoliberalism, challenging an economic development model that have been dispossessing them and oppressing them, wanting bread, wanting justice. And Europe, um, as usual, promotes democracy when it suits it and um, uh, supports ruthless dictatorships when it suits it. And it doesn't, and if it is corporate driven, it will be about profits. It will never be about environmental and climate or social justice. And that is my problem. And in the video that you showed, um, I, I liked especially Emmanuel from the DRC, who was raising the question of energy access, local energy access, because all these projects, come from Europe and it's, it, they are centered in Europe. And it, it's always about energy, European energy security. Let's decenter a bit and let's think about what the people in the global South, what the people in Africa are asking about. Are, are they asking about hydrogen technology? Are they asking? No, they ask about sovereignty. They want democratic control over their land, over their natural resources. And these are very important questions. So any renewable initiative without local communities involvement, without democratic control will fail if it is a top-down approach driven by corporations only interested in making profits, it, that transition won't be just. Uh, and I'm not just you know, accusing Europe and the global north. No, there are a lot of complicity in, in the parasitic and corrupt ruling classes in Africa. Uh, and that's what happens. It's always top, top, top an approach. And then we'll bring some, we say standards. Ah, we are involved in community here through workshops. And now it's, no, it's not true. It has not been true. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Amishin, um, for your mm -hmm. uh, key point. Now, I would, moving on from the origin question, I would like to turn to uh, Ms. Uh, Yakubuta. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, carbon pricing. Um, 
now there are many political and economic instruments that are dis being discussed to achieve carbon neutrality in the eu uh, the carbon border adjustments mechanism in short uh, cbam um, seeks to put a carbon a price on carbon imports into the eu and is seen as a key part of the green deal now which effects would such a carbon pricing instrument are for fossil fuel dependent african countries that uh, trade with europe and how can uh, negative potential negative effects be addressed let's see akubuta Yeah, so a, such a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism would um, make countries that um, produce with higher carbon emissions less competitive uh, to enter on the uh, on the EU market because it would basically increase their price to, to put it that way. Um, so it could make it impossible uh, for some of the African countries as well uh, that are highly dependent on fossil fuels for their energy, for instance, and for the production of, of the goods that they are trading. Uh, it could make it impossible for them to uh, get on the EU market in that sense. Um, what the EU is taking into account now and is working towards uh, on that end, it's the, the, the mechanism, it's still not fully developed um, as, as far as I know. Um, the idea would be to uh, accept, to waive this um, tax um, for, uh, for certain countries, especially for least developing uh, countries. And they are already doing it under the WTO uh, with certain products. And ideally, they would also do it now with, with least developing countries, also with some of the lower middle income countries. Um, yeah, I think uh, very briefly, this is uh, this is the issue, but it depends on the country context. Uh, and we talk about Africa as uh, one thing, but um, it's formed of many countries with very different uh, contexts and uh, different types of dependencies on fossil fuels, whether uh, they have to import fossil fuel themselves for their energy production or whether they are uh, exporting it um, and also the extent of electricity access that they have. Thank you for your interesting remarks, uh, Merci Akubuta. We have now uh, discussed um, green hydrogen and energy trade as it relates to the Green Deal and uh, the partnerships between EU and Africa. We will now move to the role of international development cooperation in these partnerships. And for this, I would like to hand it over to my colleague. Over to you, Caroline. Yeah, development cooperation is generally said to play a key role in Africa-EU partnerships. And Ms. Yakubuta, with the Green Deal, the EU sees itself in an exemplary role and claims that it can also provide targeted external support. So I'd like to know from you, which role does the European development cooperation with Africa play for the implementation of energy-related aspects of the Green Deal? Yeah, so first of all, it's very important that uh, they develop a common vision. As Mr. Hamuchen has also highlighted, it is important that um, it's not something that comes from the EU. And actually, this uh, is something that uh, has also been um, a concern of African countries who have perceived the EU Green Deal as potentially being imposed on African countries. I don't think that's the, uh, the actual intention, but in order for it not to become so, it is important that they um, bring relevant stakeholders at the table all the time and uh, have um, strategies that um, are beneficial to both sides. So deciding jointly. Moreover, as I said, all uh, African countries uh, have different contexts. So it's not just about generally uh, cooperating with Africa, but also tailor making strategies that are um, speaking to the context of those specific countries. In terms of um, development cooperation and how they, they could uh, make the Green Deal beneficial for African countries, I could add to what I earlier said about the carbon border adjustment mechanism. And uh, one thing is that if the EU supports those countries that are currently um, producing with high emissions, if they support them to decarbonize their systems, then they would also help
help them to uh, more easily get on the on the EU market. And one way of doing that is, for instance, the EU could um, could use the, uh, the the money that it gets from the carbon border adjustment mechanism to support some of these countries that would be negatively affected by by it uh, to to quick more quickly make the transition. Um, now, in terms of energy cooperation, uh, I will say again, the different types of countries. So there are countries in Africa that are dependent on fossil fuel uh, imports. And one of them is also Morocco that has been mentioned earlier. So these countries would greatly benefit from switching to renewables also for their own uh, energy security. There are countries with low uh, energy access, many of them. Uh, these countries, of course, should always prioritize energy access before moving towards uh, anything else. As for countries that um, are also fossil fuel exporters to the EU, um, these, assuming that their uh, energy access has been met, uh, these could be, in my opinion, very good candidates for also hydrogen trade with the EU. Um, and this would help them transition so that their economy is not as impacted by um, the EU moving away from fossil fuels and basically not taking in uh, imports, fossil fuel imports from Africa, but then starting to take in fossil fuel um, uh, imports for, uh, of hydrogen instead. So that could be a priority when the EU decides which countries uh, it can work with. Hey, thank you, Ms. Jakobucha. Talking about technologies and in, in order to work with companies to promote potential transformative technologies, Mr. Lechtenfeld, um, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Des Development launched a strategic partnership on technology in Africa. So what could be the role of this initiative for African countries to realize benefits that the Green Deal can offer? I think it's a, yeah, thank you for the, the question. So the, the S SPTA Strategic Partnership for Technology in Africa, it's basically a, a collaboration between African uh, companies and, and European, often German companies that are working in different fields on technology. It includes um, a working group on energy, it includes one on mobility, there's one on um, transport, I mentioned already, uh, agriculture is there, um, health is there, you know, so a variety of groups, water is there, governance is there. And um, in the, the, the program itself, um, it is designed around project development. So often, you know, when you have a simple, simple product that we need and we need to procure it, you can just order it and, and pay for it. But often, you know, the complexities are much harder. If you want to set up a functioning uh, micro cluster um, that can then boost economic uh, development in, in a certain location or in a, around a certain industrial park, it requires a lot of stakeholders and shareholders that come together. And, um, and this is what this, what this initiative does. So for example, in Rwanda, um, what started as an initial conversation around the automotive industry now has developed into a, a growing, but one of the largest growing um, automotive clusters outside um, South Africa on the sub-Saharan um, you know, area of the, of the continent. Or um, in, in other parts of, the, uh, of Africa, the SPTA is, is using basically, you know, looking at local needs um, with local partners and seeing how technology made in Europe can play an, play an effective role. Now, how this can be linked to the, to the European Green Deal, I think it, it really much depends on the, the scope and the complexity of the, um, of the investments that will come through. Um, my sense is, I mean, just looking on a, on a map, if one were to put seriously, you know, solar panels, somewhere in, in, you know, in, in the most sunny areas in, 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 in the Sahel, one could, of course, power the entire world. I think that has been shown very, very impressively. Now, could it be practically done? I'm not so sure how we will do it. Also, the power lines that we need and, and, and so forth. So it's, I think it's more, it's more something that, that inspires people than that it's actually the only way forward. I think energy generation has to be decentralized. That means not having one large solar park or wind park, but actually having decentralized power generation. Otherwise, you, you just lose a lot in the transmission. It's also very expensive. Um, and that, of course, means small applications, local applications, and that can create a lot of opportunities for a lot of places, a lot of countries. And you don't have what you currently have with the oil and gas industry, that it's very centered, 
very closely linked to, to a few very selective countries. So often it has become a resource curse, but instead renewable energy, because it can be widespread in its generation has the potential, if designed right, if implemented right, um, to really you know, provide benefits for communities across the continent. I think that's, that's really important. And, and I think it's also really important that, um, that individuals and groups and, and, and uh, community groups push for that, push for that inclusivity, push for you know, the benefit sharing, push for it, because it, it won't automatically come by itself. Um, you know, if, there's, there's, if, if we have standards from you know, our government to government conversations and planning, and there's push also from the, the grassroots level, I think it's very, very important because it enforces a certain mechanism or we like, well, this is exactly the messages we need to hear out of the partner countries so that we feel more comfortable in saying, yes, this is a reliable partner and we trust that, you know, civil society will be heard and will be included. And, you know, and I think that's, that's also, it's, it's very, very important. I think this is also where political foundations, whether it's the Bird Foundation or others, have an important role to play because they can bring these stakeholders in to the conversation um, from outside. So again, mostly hope, but it's a it's a very hard work, and we need to be very very careful um, to get it right. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Lechtenfeld. You mentioned especially two points, which I want uh, to bounce over to Mr. Hamushen, whom I saw nodding. Uh, one is decentralization, and the other one is looking at the local level. And um, so, Mr. Hamushen, especially large scale green energy projects can prompt questions around land rights and livelihoods in local communities. You mentioned the Wazazate um, installation in Morocco. How can development cooperation collaborate with potentially affected people and communities in order to plan for a just transition towards renewable energies? Thanks for the question, Caroline which is, I think, uh, an important one. Um, so I think, I, I think I'll make a direct point, direct answer to your question, and one general point uh, around international cooperation. Um, so uh, for me, I don't have like a problem per se with mega projects, but they have, be, they have proved in the past um, to, to be generating a lot of problems from grabs, from pollution, and so on. Uh, and, and they don't involve local communities. So that's why I'm inclined more to encouraging and supporting small scale renewable initiatives that are rooted in local communities with their approval, their consent, their involvement, their understanding of, of what they need, the local needs. And that way you ensure um, uh, that you have some kind of sovereignty, ownership of that project, and some kind of democratic control. So I'm inclined to support those, but you cannot, um, I, I'm not gonna romanticize um, small is beautiful because it might not be enough. So that's why I always put these, my analysis or my recommendation in the political and economic context. Uh, are these communities living in, in democratic conditions? Are, are they being dispossessed? Do they have control over their land and natural resources? So that's why when we talk about questions of energy transition, climate justice, we always need to talk about sovereignty over land, water, natural resources, um, democratic conditions, uh, who owns what, uh, and so on. The other general point that I would like to make about the international cooperation is if Europe and other countries are really serious about you know, cooperating with African countries and other countries in the global south in that energy transition, we need, we need to put the questions of Europe's historic responsibility in causing the ecological and climate crisis. Um, and we need to ask the question of climate debt and climate reparations. So some support and not some, huge support needs to be given to those countries, including countries in North Africa and Africa who are already overburdened with the effects of climate change from drought, from water poverty. So these questions, so this is justice. We need to talk about climate reparations and climate debts. And then you have the question of trade. 
If we maintain the same regime of global trade, we are not going to resolve the problems because it comes with its own obstacles. Uh, and in this regard, there is, there is this trade treaty called the Energy Charter Treaty, who gives power to oil and gas companies to sue governments if these governments dare to change you know, policies or to green their economies. So we need always to take into account these global processes and powerful players from corporations to international financial institutions. I hope I answered your question, Caroline, but you know, it's not enough time to go into more details. Sure, yeah. No, thank you, Mr. Hamushen. You touched upon many, many important points here. And thank you all for your valuable thoughts and contributions on the role of development cooperation in the implementation of the Green Deal. Um, with these submissions, now we come to a preliminary end of the panel discussion, as also one of our speakers, Mr. Lechtenfeld, has to leave us now, unfortunately. Um, thank you very much at this point for ta having taken the time so spontaneously to um, for this panel discussion, also for your um, yeah insights and points. And yeah, wish you a good rest of the day, working day. Thank you very much, and uh, I apologize that I cannot stick around for the for the discussion. Um, thank you very much uh, to all the to all the other panelists. Um, I think it was very very good, and I think a lot of really good points you're you're raising. And I, I I really mean when I say that you know we as a development community we have to join forces to make sure this works. I mean we have to stop the climate crisis. It is very very late, um, and I, I very much agree on on where the you know historic responsibility lies. But looking forward, it has, you know, we need to solve it as a, as a global people. And um, anything we can do to, to make that in a more just and uh, more, more sustainable way, I think is, is very much needed and welcome. I, I think I speak for everyone, when, um, you know, certainly at BMZ, um, that, is, that is our very deep ambition and, and also internal hope. And then, you know, we debate these things very, very critically inside. And it is, uh, I'm always just very, very happy that, you know, we're not giving up, people are not giving up, communities are not giving up, and like, it is, it's, it is a very hard road to decarbonize um, the world, but still trying to, to um, you know, further push on sustainability, further push on economic and social development. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have, a, have a wonderful debate. Thank you, Mr. Lechtenfeld. With that, I hand over to my colleague, colleague Alexander, who will handle the Q&A session. Thank you, Caroline and Umotunde, and many thanks to you, our viewers. I see you have been quite active, numerous questions have been posted and rated, and so we should now be able to see the questions that are the most pressing ones, according to the audience. And we'll work our way down, tackling as many of them as time allows. So let's jump right into the matter. First off, one question for Hamza Hamushen by Sophia or Sophia. I'm familiar with your articles and find them highly agreeable. Do you see a way of a decolonial cooperation between North African countries and the EU at all? If yes, how could that look like? And perhaps another question that is linked to the first one and is being asked by Lea Maya Anhalt. Which party, for example, juridical entity, could ensure local integrity versus private cooperatives? Mr. Hamoshen, over to you. Can you repeat the second question, Alexander? Is it, is it ah, yes. targeted to me? The second question is targeted to me as well. Yes, uh, which party, for example, juridical entity, could ensure local integrity versus private cooperates? But perhaps it's better to concentrate on the first question that is maybe the more important one. Yeah. So do I see any um, chances or opportunities for a decolonial cooperation between Europe and Africa? I am hopeful, um, maybe in the long term, yes. In the short and medium term, I don't think so. Um, because what do we mean by a decolonial cooperation? We mean an equal cooperation. We mean equal exchange between those countries. And this is not, this is not taking place. 
uh, European or Western domination, over trade, um, you know, over, over geopolitics is still there. It's, it's uncontested. Um, so those countries, when they enter into economic relations through trade deals, for example, they enter into a subordinate position. So you enter in a weak position with the European Union that dictates to you the kind of policies and things that you should do. And this is just in trade agreements. If we go to debts, it's, a, it's another matter as well. Debts come with conditionalities to open up your economy, to liberalize your economy, to privatize it, to allow foreign capital, to invade your country, um, to plunder your resources. And this is still taking place. So in the short and medium term, as long as these processes, uh, what I call the imperialist tools of domination are still in place from debts, trade agreements, military interventions, um, cooperation, international cooperations, because it comes within a certain paradigm, pushing for certain ideas and certain projects. As long as this still in place, uh, I don't think that we could achieve that decolonial um, cooperation. Thanks, Mr. Hamushin. Now, one question to Ms. Yakubuta, a question by Jana Zabanova. She asks, can the EU Green Deal promote industrial development in Africa? If yes, what could be some of the potential ways? If Africa starts exporting green hydrogen to Europe, can it move up the value chain a bit? and promote the development of some industrial sectors at home? Yeah. Ms. Yakubuta. Thank you very much for the question. And, and this is a, a very, yeah, a very important aspect and a way to empower Africa in, in this partnership and to, to eventually reach an eye level partnership. And that is to invest in research and development. So it can be partnerships between the EU and Africa with mutual exchange, but ensuring the establishment of some uh, such research and development um, uh, institutions in Africa and also for production. So really developing uh, the industry uh, in Africa and investing in uh, training and education uh, in building capacity so that African countries can then really become um, uh, also a competitive partner and a, a partner with a, a strong industry um, that can um, uh, provide more, uh, that, that doesn't sound, uh, not to provide more to Europe, but in order to, to develop its own com economy, basically. Um, and one, one way is also uh, through the circular economy. And it's a question of how this is going to be done. And uh, if the EU will collaborate with African countries in the circular economies, which parts of the value chain are going to, uh, to go to African countries? And of course, the, the more industrialized, um, the, the more investments there are in that sense in African countries, then um, the more of the higher value chains will they be able to uh, to take but i can see a really uh, the possibility of, of a good interlinked uh, system between the two continents that would provide mutual benefits in that sense all right thanks to you uh can you all hear me because if not then i'll change yes, something perfect. about my audio system all right everybody can hear me cool Mr. Hamushen, uh, one question to you. How would you specifically change the implementation of the Green Deal to meet the need to decolonize? That's, that's a whole discussion specifically. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I, can, I, I can make some concrete um, examples or co concrete recommendations. Um, general ones around the Green Deal or any other deal, as I said. So the current deal right now focuses on green growth, on eternal growth, and the maintaining of consumption models in Europe that are part of the problem that we have now. If we really want to live in, within the boundaries of the planet, consumption in the global north must go down. Production must go down. Otherwise, 
the same extractivist policies would be maintained. So there is a huge degrowth, you know, current and movement in Europe. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to those ideas of degrowth in, in, in the global north. So degrowth in the global north and decolonization in the global south could be a kind of you know, next step. So this is a question of growth. Um, the focus of the um, Green Deal right now, if you look at the details, it doesn't put limits on the extraction of natural resources. It doesn't put limits at all. There are, there are no limits. So companies can continue uh, doing that uh, in the globals, actually, and they are continuing to do that, not just the old projects, but they are exploring for new fields, including in my home country in Algeria, like going to do fracking and offshore drilling at the same time that Europe is talking about the European Green Deal. So there is, there is, there is a kind of a hypocrisy here. And then the third point, it's around techno, techno fixes, the focus on technology and techno fixes as if it's going to resolve all our problems, as well as the failed um, uh, market-based uh, false solutions like carbon trading and so on. So this needs to be rejected. We need to talk about you know, radical steps right now. We need to cut down emissions, which means cut down on consumption, uh, put limits on what the multinationals are doing outside. So these are some things that we could bring to the table to make that Green Deal at least a little bit more adequate. And, and, and the other point that I made and I make again and again and again, it, it is corporate driven. It focuses on the private sector, always the private sector. The private sector is interested in making short-term profits. It's not, yeah, so. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I very much like the, that first point you made, and I'd like to take it up and pass it on to Ms. Jakobuta, um, the one about the growth paradigm within the Green Deal. Um, more on continuous economic growth, is that a viable and a sustainable thing? And most of all, is it possible to, to reconcile growth with drastically bringing down carbon emissions? What do we need? Do we need more growth? Do we need degrowth? more consumption, less consumption? Uh, what is your opinion on yeah, that? Yeah, it, it is a very good question and I would not find myself as an expert on the topic. So I will not say, yes, it is possible or no, it is not possible. So I'm not uh, a modeler in that sense or uh, you know, I have not looked deep enough into the topic. I know about it, I am aware about it. I know there's high criticism also uh, towards the 2030 agenda and the SDGs because their uh, economic growth is um, expected. So it, it's also one of the targets. Um, it is important to recognize that um, developing countries will need to uh, continue to grow in order to, to reach, uh, you know, the adequate standards um, and have access to basic services and uh, also to, to reduce inequalities um, across countries in, in the world. Um, developing, developed countries have started to reduce their footprint and to have a kind of economic growth that has a lower footprint, uh, both on emissions, uh, both in terms of emissions, but also um, in terms of biodiversity and so on, but still uh, the, the impacts are massive. So we're definitely not there to say that uh, our growth doesn't have an impact. At the same time, I do have hope personally in, in um, in technology uh, to support us, but we should not see it as uh, the only the only thing that we need to do. Um, I don't. I would not uh, villainize the private sector as much. Um, I I do agree with some of the points of, of Mr. Hamuchen, uh, and uh, it is true that unfortunately and sadly, um, the, the, some corporations have only focused on profits, and they have been one of the biggest. Um, um, causes um, and perpetrators of um, the environmental issues that we are facing at the moment. Uh, but it's not just the private sector. Like Just to say the EU is also supporting its private sector uh, at home domestically, and it doesn't have just negative effects. It also has positive effects. Um, 
And at the same time, uh, implementing projects with governments um, cannot always ensure that there will not be negative effects because unfortunately, uh, corruption and vested interests are still there. So I would not see this as the solution. My, the first question that was posed to me was re re with regard to industrialization. And um, in that sense, investing in the private sector in, in developing countries will be necessary to expand industrialization. It is unlikely that, um, I mean, of course it depends on the, on the countries, but um, it would not be only in the public sector um, that, uh, that uh, is a given. What the EU can do to tackle some of these issues is really to support strong regulatory frameworks and strong adequate policies within those countries in order to ensure that the private sector also um, leads to benefits. A stronger private sector leads to benefits and not for, for all the people and not just for the few. Thank you. One last question to you, Mr. Hamoshen. I can see there are still many aspects to be touched. And I realize there are so many interesting ones, but we're slowly running out of time here. Something that caught my interest, though, has got to do with the general public. Um, one asks, how important is it to include the general public on both sides of the Mediterranean in this sustainability discussion about the Green Deal? Do we leave it up to a selected few to come up with those decisions or should we be more inclusive? I, th I think there is, there is an important point to be told here. That shift in the narrative that we are seeing right now around the Green Deal, the Green New Deal, the just transition, so even governments, the European Union in the global north are talking about it. Um, they are making all those ambitious you know, plans and projects to cut down emissions. That shift of narrative has been the result of sustained activism and campaigning from communities, activists, trade unionists, uh, social movements, indigenous communities in the global north and in the global south. So without that sustained pressure from below, the people on the top wouldn't have changed their minds. And we've seen the complacency that the science has been clear for decades that we need to take actions, but they haven't. So of course, public engagement is very important. And that's why these kind of events that raise awareness about issues, about contradictions, about problems, um, we are having a political discussion around those issues. And we need, we need the public opinion to be on board, to understand the challenges, the difficulties, and what would happen so that's, that's why for me, the, always the question of justice need to be here. And justice means democratic control, means democratic involvement, means transparency. So yes, I agree. Um, public involvement is very important. Right. Thank you so much. And also being mindful of time, as we don't want to keep you here for the rest of this day, I feel we could be discussing for so much longer, but uh, we will need to come to a close very soon. So now I think is as good a place as any to end uh, because we do want to give our speakers a chance each to express their views and give some remarks for a last time. A big thank you goes to you, our audience, for your active participation and also to our speakers for your knowledgeable answers. And behind the scenes, Ani and Eva have supported me with the question management, so I'm very grateful for their contrib contribution as well. Also, they're the ones who prepared the outstanding introduction video and invested a lot of time and effort in making it good. So kudos to the two of you. And with that, I'll give it back to the moderation team. Thank you, Alexander. We now come to the concluding part of our event and uh, it's been fascinating thus far. And we would like to give our speakers the opportunity to make a closing statement. And I uh, would like to ask in one or two sentences, if you could look into the future and um, wish for a scenario, what do you want the Green Deal to have contributed to Africa-EU energy partnerships uh, by 2050? I would like to start with you, uh, Ms. Yakubuta. 
Thank you. Um, I would like to see a strong partnership of equals between Africa and, and the EU with uh, an eye level engagement and cooperation. Uh, I would like to see the two continents growing together uh, into both becoming highly resilient um, to climate change and also low carbon economies, uh, uh, achieving also the SDGs, um, and to have better to have integrated uh, trade and systems that are beneficial to both sides that maximize synergies and that reduce uh, trade-offs between the two. Thank you. Mr. Mushin, over to you. I'll try to be brief. So I would say from till 2050, I would like to see more justice in the world. Um, because we're not just fighting ecological or, or climate breakdown, we are fighting for a better world. We are fighting of world of justice, a world that puts people and the planet before profits. Um, so in that sense, I'd like to see a transition towards a system change, a system that protects nature, that protects human, that does not exploit them and plunder resources, and generates other externalities. So I don't want to see uh, a kind of green capitalism or green colonialism. I'd like to see, you know, green justice. Um, that's 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 the words that I would like to finish with. Thank you, Mr. Mishin. So strong partnerships of equal for Ms. Yakubuta and green justice from Mr. Mishin. So with these closing remarks, all that remains to do is for us to close this uh, event. And uh, for that, I will hand over to my colleague, Carolyn. Carol. Yeah, a lot to do until 2050, I'd say. Well, then all that remains to me, um, for me to do is to close this event. So that was it, the first webinar in this year's series of development policy discussion days on the topic Partners in Climate, the role of African renewables in the Re European Green Deal. We have learned about opportunities and risks in the Green Deal for African countries, about energy partnerships and the role of green hydrogen production and trade. Finally, we also touched upon the role of international development cooperation in the implementation of the Green Deal. We have been ably supported by our fellow team members. Alex already mentioned two of them. So there is Annika Reimann, Eva Kilmes, Konstantin Malach, Lea Strack and Jonas Schaaf, as well as Eva Graf. Thank you. And on behalf of the whole team, I would give a special thanks to our panelists for their participation and stimulating contributions to the discussion. So thank you to the two of you and also to Mr. Lechtenfeld. Thank you very much to the organizers and also to the panelists for this engaging discussion. It was a pleasure. Thank you as well. Likewise, I really enjoyed it. Another thanks goes to Yetunde Fadeyi, Atseslam Ben Brahim, Gesachu Fekadu, and Emmanuel Musuyu, who were the speakers in our second video. Thank you to Heinrich Böll Foundation for partnering with us in the organization of this event. And also a big thank you thanks to you dear listeners for your lively interest and your questions and precious time please give us your feedback what do you think was good what can we do better next time the link to our evaluation form should appear in the chat now there you can write your opinion about today and also leave your email in case you want to stay informed we would also like to point out that our colleagues are working on a briefing paper that summarizes the discussion and provides further information about the topic. It will be finalized and published in due course via SLE channels. And if you wish to receive it via email, you can leave your address in the evaluation form. Finally, we would like to draw your attention to the next two events of our colleagues. Today at 3 p.m. Central European Summertime, we will continue with an online panel discussion on smallholder digitalization in Sub-Saharan Africa. And tomorrow at 9.30, another event on labels and due diligence with respect to sustainability will take place. We look forward to welcoming you there as well. And 
just like this discussion, all events will be held in English language which, with simultaneous translation. A uh, quick reminder to our two speakers, um, we will have the debriefing in another Zoom room immediately after this event. So the link has been sent to you via email this morning. Thank you all for your interest and your active participation. Goodbye. We wish you a pleasant day.